how to make NES reproductions. Now, I will say this is a starter video and there is probably still a lot of information that I have not shared in the video and I might go back, go back and make some video about that kind of stuff. Um, first and foremost is how to get the actual data or ROMs or whatever. You should already know how to do that, if I'm being honest. Um, I might go into little details about how to split the file and stuff, but for the most part this is just the actual physical, const physical construction. Um, I will say I've been doing this for a couple years and there are some things that kept me from doing it for a couple years. You know, if I'd have been doing this back in 2010, I might actually be doing a lot more of it because it is pretty rewarding and fun, um, especially if you like Nintendo and you like electronics. Uh, but these days, the market is so flooded with people that do reproductions, it's hard to do it as a profession. Um, it's hard to do it for much profit. Uh, you have to be selling quite a bit of quantity and you still have the whole gray area of legality. Um, now if you were doing homebrews, you know, if you're set up with some programmer then there's probably, you know, you're probably never going to have any legal issues. But there's still the potential if you're doing, um, let's just say there's a, a, a Japanese or European game that was never released in the U.S., much like what I'm getting ready to show you, then you could actually run into some copyright infringement issues. Um, I will say I have tried to sell quite a few reproductions on eBay over the years, over the last couple of years, and I they get pulled down all the time. Now, what's weird is, is you can go and, I'll, I'll go and look, for the exact same reproduction and there'd be you know five ten other people selling the exact same thing when mine got pulled so and, and you know my eBay account had problems way back in the day like ten years ago when I was still a punk kid and doing dumb shit my account got suspended a few times and every time I try and, and there's been a few times when I'll just I'll sell a, uh, a top loader composite modded if I've got certain words in there they'll pull it Okay, and I think I've talked about this before in some other videos, and, oh, I know what it was. Uh, when I first started, first started doing RGB modded Nintendos, I put in there that it was emulator-like quality video. And it got pulled immediately, and it, it didn't even make it, it didn't even get put up. Like, I, I tell, I'm telling you, eBay has some kind of word search that they'll come through your ad before it ever gets put up. So the word emulator got flagged and my, my uh, ad never got posted. And I got warnings for it. And I got, uh, I don't think I got suspended that time because it had been a long time since I had any trouble. But all that little shit has added up to where I'm, I'm pretty sure eBay, you know, uh, they kind of bullied me a little bit. I would, that's the wrong word. Um, but I'm under the microscope compared to everybody else. So. You know, like right now, Devil World is the only reproduction that I have up for sale on eBay. And there's for one reason is because um, I don't use the word reproduction, although it is plainly clear on the picture of the cartridge because it's on the label. But eBay uh, didn't see it as a legal problem because they actually have uh, the details for that game, even though it's a European game you can actually link it straight to NES Devil World. So, like Zelda Outlands, there is no details for that game because it, it's not a true NES game. So, you know, if you end up leaking it to regular Zelda, you know, the picture's different and shit like that, and they pulled in, they, you know, they pull mine immediately. So, I, I really gave up on the whole idea of doing this, uh, like, a lot, and definitely have stopped doing it on eBay and I'm just I've got like two or three more Devil Worlds left that I had made up that once they sell on eBay I probably won't sell any reproductions ever again. Um, I think some of the more professional or uh, bigger name guys usually sell reproductions on their site only. Um, 
you'll see a lot of people on Nintendo Age trying to sell them. Uh, and that's, that's the thing is, once everybody learned how to do it, the market got flooded with people and they kept undercutting everybody. So, you know, the first first guys were selling reproductions for fifty hundred dollars, you know, because it was so few people doing it they could ask whatever they wanted. You know, the next guy come out and sell them for forty, the next guy come out and sell them for thirty five, you know, and just keep going down. And I think there's people out there that'll do it for twenty bucks now. And that to me, I don't know I mean the amount of time you gotta put into doing this, there is no way they're making any money. You know, because I mean even doing one, I would suspect you could put anywhere from four to eight hours into it. You know, depending on how long it took you to clean the card and clean the label off and uh, to get the chips off the donor board or whatever you're going to do. So, that's a, a warning to anybody that wants to get into this to make profit. I would say find something else, honestly. And I think the same thing is happening on, uh, on other uh, consoles. I think there's plenty of people doing Sega repros and, you know, SNES and N64, just all the cartridge stuff is, is, is just getting overrun with people that do it. So this is just uh, how to do it yourself, you know, not necessarily how to be a pro at it or, or make a living off of it. Uh, I'm going to start right off into uh, programming your EEPROMs and stuff like that, and we'll just simply go through some of the steps it takes to get to the finish and I, I think I mentioned a few times in the video but there are plenty of other ways to make this happen easier than using a donor cart um, at this time I don't think Bunny Boy is selling them but he used to sell new cases and I think there were like clear red, blue, green, clear uh, all that stuff and I, for some reason he's just not selling right now. I don't know why. I really wish he would. And I don't know of anybody else selling new actual cartridge shells. So that leads you back to the donor problem. But also, he sold what was called a Repro Pack. And that was a board that you could actually turn into a bunch of the easier um, classes of games like Enrom or CNROM, AO, and whatever they were. There was like six or seven different ones you could turn this board into and it made it really really easy so you didn't have to rewire it um, the board was already made for EEPROMs um, there was a spot for his uh, CIC chip uh, the lockout chip and um, of course that's another reason to use donors is you know that was, a, that was an extra well, eight or ten dollar expense to get that chip put on there the board was only four bucks though and I want to say the shells were five six maybe five six bucks and they were nice um, so if anybody does know of anybody making new shells please hit me up um, there is another guy that makes boards uh, infinite NES lives um, I used one for the Mr. Gimmick uh, Batman Return of the Joker and it worked pretty well for a little while and then it quit working and I don't know why yet. I might end up sending it back to him to see if he can figure out what's wrong with it. But it was a little. It was. It was like close to 20 bucks for the board, which it's a super expensive reproduction to make anyway. So it's worth it. You know. I mean, if you did make that one a reproduction, you probably could still sell that one for a decent amount of profit. Nobody's gonna be selling that one for sub 30 dollars. I wouldn't think. So I think I'm done rambling. Let's get on with this. Uh, a couple more points that I, uh, I just watched the intro and seen a couple things I missed out. Um, about donors, this is where you'll get a lot of hate and flack. Um, a lot of people out there don't like the idea of using donors because you're destroying an original game. Um, and Mr. Gimmick is one of those. Uh, there's a, uh, only one game you can use to make that as a donor, and that's Batman Return of the Joker, and it's a rare game. And people don't like the idea that you're destroying that game to make uh, a Mr. Gimmick. I was going to talk about the time you could put into reproduction. Now, the long hours remark I made, that really comes into play when you're trying to make the more complicated uh, games that you have to rewire the EEPROM chips. You know, you have to lift this leg and wire it to this 
pot or this via, you know, all this kind of stuff. That's where it can get pretty hairy. And I might actually end up making some videos about that if I get in requests. Um, but yeah, um, the last easy option is to just not make a reproduction and use a flash cart. I mean, you see me pull the power pack and the EverDrive out all the time. Those will play most of the games, and you could probably buy one power pack for what it would cost you to buy, you know, three or four reproductions of something. Um, you know, that's I'm, that's probably back where we, we come into the homebrews. A lot of homebrews don't get their ROMs released, and that's a good thing, you know, because then they sell cartridges, and that's where they make their money and stuff. But yeah, let's dig in a little bit here. Okay, about one of the first things that you're going to want to do is to split a ROM. Okay, so you got your your .NES ROM file and that .NES contains the PROG and the CHAR and the header file and it's usually the header file that will tell you what PCB class you're in and that will tell you what kind of uh, donor you want to use. Let's see, I'm going to go find Devil World and this video is going to focus on NROMs, which are definitely the easiest to start with. Okay, so there it says you see the E. That means it's European, and then the exclamation point means it's been verified good dump, I believe. So you load your .NES or your ROM or whatever, and you can hit this Analyze ROM button right here, and that will show you right there that is an NROM mapper. And it'll also show you what the prog and char are going to end up being. And then over here you say remove the header and then the output in different chars. Auto split it. And for some reason, uh, maybe it's just my version of the NES Mapper Reader program. It Whenever I make it do it, it always says it failed if the prog and char are not the same. But it ends up putting them out in just fine. I don't know why. So that's where you come up with your two files that you actually program to the chip. And it also put out this dot bit this NES bin that does not have char or prog into it like these two do. And that's useless. You can just delete that still in use with this program. I always get rid of it. I never do anything with it. Uh, just trying to open it. Um, I made myself a little note right here to solder the V-bridge on the PCB. That's just the mirroring. Um, oh, that, that's another thing that uh, I use the mapper program for. So we'll just reload Devil World here and analyze it. And it says right here, horizontal mirroring. Okay. For whatever reason, that means you have to solder the V bridge. And it's just a difference of what Nintendo calls mirroring and um, what everybody else calls it, I guess. So it's usually whatever opposite of that. Now you get into the uh, PCB classes with mappers and stuff, and a lot of those won't have the two uh, pads on there for horizontal and vertical they just they they take care of the mapper chips themselves take care of it so that'll get you real close to the next part so to program the chips for the reproductions I bought this mm, four or five years ago maybe three four years ago I've had it for a long time anyway and it's an older uh, Willem, W-I-L-L-E-M, I believe, and it is a PCB 5.0B, so it's an older version of this, and it is a parallel port version, so I still have my old computer uh, that has a parallel port, kept it around just for this reason. Um, let's see what else, it is a 32-pin ZIF, 
and I put a switch over here for the voltages, which we'll get into. Actually, we'll get into it on this Devil World one, as a matter of fact. And then you have your dip switches down here, which and I'll show you the program next. It'll show you what those need to be set on. But the rest of the board, I really have never had to mess with. Uh, I think maybe I've had to move this jumper one time for um, maybe programming a 27C801 or something like that. Other than that, I don't really think I've messed with anything. I believe I may have actually tried... It does have a USB port over here for power only. I think I tried to power up with USB once and uh, I think it couldn't provide enough amperage if I had other stuff plugged into the USB ports on the computer so I just went ahead and powered it through a wall wart. So the program that came with it. It's simple, but somehow they seemed to complicate it. <laughs> and yes, the manual's in Chingrish. So, basically, this button here will help you choose what chip you're going to use. And for Devil World, the char is going to go on a 2764 and then I make sure that my dip switches match 1, 2, 4, 6, 9 and yes my dip switches are correct and here's the thing about 2764's is they almost always use higher voltage for programming so that switch I showed you I'm actually going to put it up on 21 volts instead of 12 which almost everything bigger than that uses and then I will open file I've already got open here so the char file is 8 kilobytes okay and your EEPROM chips are in bits so 8 times 8 is 64 so you got 2764 so throw that to the ZIF lock it down load the char, you can blank test your chip first, which I cleaned and blanked these a long time ago. And then you hit the program chip. And if you're lucky, it'll program without problems. 2764s are awful slow. As you'll see, the bigger 128 one next goes faster than this. Program it, then it'll verify it, and then it'll say programmed OK. Um, I will say I've had a few that did not verify, and all I did was program them again. Didn't do anything, didn't change anything, just hit the program button again, and it verified okay. That's the thing with programming EEPROMs is you're just changing the ones to zeros. Okay, so I could hit that program button again, and it's just going to do the exact same thing, and it'll verify again okay. So you're not going to hurt it by trying to double program it. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and do two chips since I have two boards prepared. And there is a verify button up here that says verify if you can't read it and it just does the exact same thing that verify just did verify is okay and you can actually read EEPROMs off here which I've done before but I've never used it in, in any way okay so now we want to do the prog so I'm going to change this to 27C128 and luckily the dip switches are the same, one, two, four, six, nine. And then I load the prog bin. And I program the chip and see it's going a lot faster. And as a matter of fact, I 
forgot to put my power switch down on 12 volts and it's still programmed okay. The second chip here. There you go, that's as easy as it gets for programming the chips. Okay, a couple points that I kind of missed. Uh, when I was talking about the power switch, if you try to program the 2764 in 12 volt mode, 12 volt mode, you might actually get an error, and you might think, "Oh, there's something wrong with the EEPROM, blah blah blah." Well, it might just be that you need to program it with 21 volts. And um, about the quickness, about how they program, the 128 is faster than the 64, but the 256 and on and on and on gets slower and slower and slower because there's so much more data to pass through there. Okay, so here's an NROM donor board. As you see, I'm doing a batch of them. And this is pretty easy, as really all you need to do is to remove the char and prog chips. And you also want to make note of your vertical or horizontal mirroring. This will actually be opposite to what you're thinking or what you see whenever you use uh, like a splitter program or something like that when you get your files ready to burn. So I'm going to take the uh, Hake 808 and remove all these chips and then we'll uh, be mostly ready to solder on our EEPROMs. Okay, so even just desoldering took a while. I usually desolder the V and H thing, and that didn't quite get it all off. But I should be able to swipe over that with my soldering iron. Give a couple seconds to heat up here. I just want to make sure there's no continuity on the H because I'm pretty sure the game that I'm making you have to solder the V pad. And I used to have an X-Acto knife that was rounded like that, that was all dull, and it was perfect for going down through here and trying to move those pins back and forth to just get them to last a little bit of solder to come loose. And I really haven't come up with a good way of doing it otherwise. Doing it with your fingers sucks. And then get your uh, pulling tool. I highly recommend getting one of these. They're super cheap. Sticking out a chip. I usually wiggle back and forth until they break free. And that one's not working with me. You do want to be careful here because if there is enough solder still sticking on the pad, you can pull the pad and trace off the PCB and you'll ruin it. Get one side up, you can wiggle it. Sometimes I might give you an idea of which pin is still sticking, but we're not trying to save these proms. So if one breaks, which one did, no big deal. It's really that simple. This one's just not wanting to break free. Usually the Heiko is so good at desoldering these pins that this extra work isn't really necessary. This thing is just too big for this. I need to be able to get under the pins like that. I really just need to go buy another set of these and dull this one because this one can get right at the base. push on them. That one 
click to hear it. If you do this enough, you'll hear them click and let loose if there was a little bit of solder holding it. And especially pins that are on power and ground. Like, let's see if I can point to this one. Get the light over here. Right there. There's no thermal relief on that pad at all. So it takes quite a bit of heat to melt it. And that's why I'll actually look at it straight down and have the solder sucker on one side and I'm watching the pin on this side and you can see the solder kind of melt. And that's when you know it's okay to hit the button and suck it. There we go. And if I have any that didn't quite open up all the way, use a tiny drill bit to work through them. It just makes it easier to insert the EEPROM legs. Just drill it out. I couldn't tell you what that is. Probably an O2O. It's an 025. About the perfect size for the legs to get through. Could go a little bigger. So that is an in ROM board ready to go. Pretty simple. Let's see if I can get this in the macro lens. If you do it right, you can actually watch the heat run right up the pin let's see if I can get some better light maybe See that? Actually watch it run right up the pin. Hmm. That worked. Cool. And of course, uh, another good way to prevent tearing traces off is to kind of hold it up to the light, let the light shine through and look through, and see if you can actually see any of the vias or holes that look partially plugged and just go back and simply add some more solder to it and try it again you know leave your soldering on there and let it get hot and then just come back and you might have a lot better luck with it the second time yeah that one looks much better okay so we've got our donor board cleared and we have our EEPROM chips programmed and checked so it's simply a matter of lining it up right you got your notch on one end so that's pin one and you got your notch marked on the board too I always end up with EEPROMs with bent legs or whatever so I try to straighten them out before I get to this point they should already be I guess they already straightened from programming but they're never quite perfect and it's always a little bit of a fight to get them in there. You should try to get to the point where there's force on all the legs and then find out which one's holding up the rest of them. Try to bend that one down. And if it just is impossible I might switch and start with inserting all of these pins first and trying to go for the other side and then I usually bend a couple legs just to hold it in place and then we just solder it in
Okay, so the chips are soldered in place. Give it a good look over, make sure you didn't miss any. And I didn't use any flux on the pins, but it wouldn't hurt if you did. Put some flux on the V on the uh, V bridge. Make that one. You can go back with your meter and make sure there's no continuity on the H pad, but I can clearly look at it and see that there's not. And now we can test again.